since I could talk about anything I wanted, I wanted to talk about public ethics, which underlines the scholarship that I've done, uh, going back to my PhD work, which was a cross between the, the College of Education, uh, the Department of History of Science and Technology, uh, the School of Public Health, uh, Public Health Interventions, and Biomedical Ethics, looking at how we justify the work we do in extension uh, and to public stakeholders, because public health has a very well-developed system of ethical justification out of biomedical ethics for justifying their public interventions, whether it's vaccines, housing, or whatever it is. Um, so lots of people uh, rely on a lot of people, use the materials from a lot of people in this presentation, particularly the glyphosate material that I'm going to use as an example, uh, which I have been working on since 2015 and, and have done some contributions in that uh, area. So I have some of the slides I've repurposed from some other folks, as well as some of the other material uh, in this presentation. This has been the quote that's actually guided me uh, in my career uh, knowledge and understanding are not separated from political moral action. Theory cannot be separated from rational practice. When you think about the land-grant mission and what we do in extension, um, this is really sort of an academic for, uh, a quote that actually describes our mission. And Marjorie Brown actually did quite a bit of her work here at the University of Minnesota, one of the more seminal thinkers on extension theory and philosophy uh, for extension service uh, in the 20th century. This is right off of the Extension website. Uh, University of Minnesota Extension discovers science-based solutions, delivers practical education, and engage Minnesotans to build a better future. And I think you can see how that's just a different way of stating this quote. The work we do does have uh, political moral action and building a better future for Minnesotans. We are looking at rational practice based on research-based education. Um, in my role with working with IPM and pesticides in my career, I've been pushed, prodded, pulled, uh, threatened, um, uh, any other term to move me around to advocate or not advocate on a whole series of controversial public issues around pest management, environmental protection, and of course, pesticides. So I'm going to use one example to talk about how uh, I've looked at this whole issue of our land-grant mission and providing a rationale that justifies whether or not we should be doing education which respects individual autonomy of the learner decide for themselves, or we're obligated to go to paternalistic experts. We know better as experts what people should do and try to convince them to do it. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating piece. Um, many of you have heard about glyphosate, Roundup, and the uh, uh, civil court award. Uh, this is not criminal court. That's completely different. Uh, Monsanto was given an award by a jury to pay $289 million to a gentleman who worked as a long, uh, um, landscape uh, keeper uh, because that person had used Roundup and he, they convinced the jury that uh, Monsanto was responsible for his, his cancer. Uh, this has been modified to some degree, but, the, uh, but actually the, uh, this still stands. Uh, the award still stands uh, in a somewhat lesser amount. Another example, closer to home, Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, somebody is suing Roundup for uh, Monsanto for using Roundup uh, causing cancer. And uh, because I'm a baby boomer, I watch broadcast news like other baby boomers. And I'm watching the news in the morning, drinking my coffee before going to work. You know, they have they sit around a table and talk about stuff. And they bring in somebody to talk about General Mills' lawsuit with Roundup showing up in Cheerios. Um, which is it's real close to home because General Mills headquarters is just on the other side of Minneapolis uh, and is a major food processor in the state and the oats we grow goes into Cheerios. So uh, glyphosate use in, in the United States, um, uh, this goes up to 2014, the line continues. Uh, agricultural is by far the largest use, but because of scale, it's hard to see, but we've seen a doubling, more than a doubling of Roundup use in non-agricultural uses in the same time period, so it's not unsubstantial. I think this is a fascinating map to look at. The darker the color, the more Roundup per square mile is used. You look where Minnesota is, um, corn and soybeans, uh, is a major use, cotton, uh, genetically modified crops that you can apply Roundup on. Um, so it is a significant 
issue that I got pulled into working with master gardeners and other people back in 2015 when the World Health Organization Interagency for Research on Cancer reclassified a glyphosate from a possible human carcinogen to their probable human carcinogen category, which triggered these lawsuits in civil court and uh, a lot of advocacy about wanting to ban, uh, ban glyphosate because it's a carcinogen. I mean, you think of a parent watching this new show, um, uh, broadcast news show, and they're talking about residues of Roundup and Cheerios that they just bought for their kids. I mean, you can just put that together. Um, so the question is, should we in extension advocate, not just educate farmers and others about this issue, but actually advocate for the banning and use of glyphosate given the toxicological, epidemiological, and cancer research to the chemical? So how many say we should? I'm going to ask this again. How many say we shouldn't? How many don't care? How many won't raise a hand in public because you grew up in Minnesota? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand. I, I use the clickers. They work a lot better because they're anonymous. Um, this is because we can look at the same thing and see something very, very different. Um, so I want you to look at this and how many boxes do you see? How many boxes do you see if I tell you I'll pay you $1,000 per box and you tell me how many boxes are up there? Of course, you can figure out up to six boxes you know, if you're clever. Um, and therefore, I'd have to pay you $6,000. But let's turn it around. How many boxes do you see if I ask you to pay me $1,000 per box? And you, this is a smart group, so I'm sure they all figured out. There's no boxes up here. This is just light on the screen. Uh, so you don't pay me anything. Um, we can look at exactly the same thing and come to completely different conclusions. And it sounds rational. Um, and so I want you to keep that in mind as we walk through, does glyphosate cause cancer? The answer is complicated. And this is part of my world in health and safety, uh, working with pesticide applicators. And I do have a, a long and intermittent but long relationship with the School of Public Health on various uh, grant projects and things uh, to pick this up. Um, glyphosate works on a particular acid pathway that does not exist in humans and animals, which makes it extremely low, to acutely toxic to people and most animals, which makes it very safe from an acute toxicity point of view. It has an extremely low skin absorption rate. Most applicators who handle pesticides absorb pesticides through the skin. Um, glyphosate itself has a less than a 2% absorption rate, which is very low. The aquatic versions of glyphosate, which is brand name Rodeo from Monsanto for aquatic weeds, does not have any surfactants in it because surfactants are toxic to aquatic organisms, but you don't need surfactants if you're putting it in water to kill aquatic weeds. Uh, the surfactants would be useless. Um, doesn't even require gloves. The label doesn't even require gloves because of such low acute toxicity and the absorption rate through the skin is so low that uh, it doesn't even trigger occupational health and safety standards to require to wear gloves. Uh, it also has a very high KOC, which makes it an attractive product too, because the KOC is a measure of how tightly chemicals are bound to soil and particles and organic matter, especially organic matter, turns out to be really important in this. And it is so tightly bound to the, in the soil that roots can't pull the chemical up and has absolutely no root activity to weeds. It's only a foliar herbicide. If you apply it to the soil, it's bound instantly to the soil, which means it's not going to leach to groundwater and it's not going to run off into surface water. It's low human toxicity and it's not going to get into water. Uh, uh, it's one of the better, those characteristics, one of the better herbicides that we actually have. Um, there's been over 800 studies of various kinds, toxicological and epidemiological studies on glyphosate and cancer. I do, I've done a lot of master gardener education over the years, uh, taught for 10 years the core course for new master gardeners, the IPM section, uh, theory and philosophy IPM, and the pesticide uh, safety section. And um, it's, it's, most people have no idea that we know what we know, the, the scale of research that goes on with these products from health and safety. A lot of thinking that we have very little information when in fact we have more information 
about these kinds of chemicals than almost any other chemicals uh, in the marketplace. You think of cleaning products. Um, we know much more about pesticide health effects than we do cleaning products that you can buy uh, in the grocery store. Um, there have been some of these studies that did find an association, a majority did not. Um, the strongest associations, and I'm actually going to show you the data, were for non-Hodgkin lymphoma and multiple myeloma, which both relate to white blood cells, which is right away raises a red flag if you're a toxicologist because it has similar sites of action. So that is a red flag that maybe something's going on here. Remind you that association in epidemiological studies is not cause and effect. Just because these uh, two things are associated, it doesn't mean there's a third factor that's actually causing the disease. We don't know. We have to do the toxicological and biochemical uh, research to actually connect the chemical to the disease. Epidemiological studies are very, can be very strong circumstantial evidence and give us uh, strong guidance of where we should spend limited research dollars to find out where the problems really are. Um, cherry picking, groundbreaking new study really distorts the record. In epidemiolo epidemiology and toxicology, you have to look at the entirety of the research base. A brand new study that gets into the media, gets on social media, uh, people assume it proves something. But if you put it into the context of all the other studies, it suddenly looks very different and you have to look at the preponderance of the literature, and you have to have the expertise to analyze the design and strength and statistical analysis of these various studies. Uh, and that takes a very sophisticated level of expertise, which is over on the other campus, by the way, uh, not on this campus. Uh, so people who interpret these studies and don't have the expertise, I always take with a very uh, big grain of salt. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of these spurious correlations. This is one that's are going and making the rounds in my world. Um, uh, we have 100%, almost 100% correlation between per capita consumption of margarine and the divorce rate in Maine from 2000 to 2009. I don't think anybody can come up with an actual rational reason why margarine consumption would influence the divorce rate or the divorce rate would influence margarine consumption in Maine. But these things happen all the time. Epidemiological studies show these kinds of things. The better studies designed rule off, have methods of ruling out these sort of third factors and trying to focus in on what's going on, but it is still associational. Um, here's a graph showing a summary of the 800 studies on glyphosate and cancer by different types of cancer. Uh, total childhood at the top, um, and this was put together by Andrew Kniss out at the University of Wyoming. And notice non-Hodgkin lymphoma and myeloma. Those are the ones that stand out. The, the, the epidemiologists look at this and they jump out right away. That's why there is that concern. 1.0 is the odds ratio. If it's, if it's a 1.0 means there's no effect. If it's less than one, they found a decrease in cancer with supposed to glyphosate. Greater than one, you have an increasingly stronger association um, to uh, glyphosate exp uh, exposure and cancer. And this is on a logarithmic scale. A 2.0 rating would be 100%, a doubling of cancer rate. It sounds catastrophic in lay people's terms. In epidemiological terms, it's interesting. Um, they will not pursue regulatory action on something that shows a 2.0 odds ratio where all the research data averages around two. It's a high concern and that's where they would do additional research to confirm whether or not it's actual cause and effect. But to the public, a doubling of the cancer rate in a study just sounds catastrophic and it influences uh, behavior and influence how uh, public officials will respond. So here's a close up of those case control retrospective studies on non hodgkin lymphoma and glyphosate. Here's one, here's 10, here's point one. Um, retrospective case control studies are you get two groups of people. This is why they're called case controls. One has the disease and one doesn't, and you try to match the two groups demographically as closely as identically as possible. And then you ask them 
15 years ago when you used glyphosate, how many times a year did you use it? Did you wear gloves? Did you stand upwind or downwind when you poured it? Uh, did you fix application of the sprayer while you were applying? Because we know that increases exposure. There's a whole series of questions they asked trying to determine what the exposure was 15 and 20 years ago. Of course, there's some limitations with doing that because you're doing a factual recall uh, between the two groups. But in this case, they're all above one. But this is the 95% confidence interval. I think everybody in this room works in research. If the 95% confidence interval crosses the no effect level, what do you conclude? What do you conclude? Yeah. And this is the strongest set of studies showing an association between cancer, uh, glyphosate and cancer. They're all above one. So we need more research. This says there's something going on here. It's worth more research. It could be, but we don't know. But these confidence, this one comes right up to one. That's the best one. Uh, but the 95% confidence interval does not support um, a, a strong association between glyphosate and cancer. Is that enough for us to decide that we should advocate to ban glyphosate? Well, any cancer, any additional cancer should be prevented. But we have lots of other things that are stronger, more likely to cause cancer that we don't regulate as carcinogens. So how do we figure that out from a public policy point of view? Um, so Natalie used a knife when she worked on this. I, when I turned this over to her, I used a screwdriver. Natalie's pretty smart. The knife, the kitchen knife works better for this than a screwdriver uh, example. Um, is this an inherently dangerous object? And I hope you raise your hands, yes. Raise your hand if you think yes. Raise your hand if you think no. Some of you raised your hand no. This is, is it inherently dangerous? In the hands of a trained chef, what is the chance of serious injury? Almost zero? I think most people would say almost zero. Uh, some or a lot. In the hands of, we have these things in our kitchen. How, how often do we have serious injury from a kitchen knife? It happens. It has happened to me. Um, but think about whether something is inherently dangerous or how likely that danger, that harm is going to happen. That's what we're talking about. This is one that uh, a colleague of mine put together a number of years ago from University of Maryland. She's a toxicologist but works in the entomology department and she's our go-to person. She's my counterpart in Maryland. Um, for pesticide safety education, and we go to her on health and safety stuff. And she posts this in a presentation when I had her out here to talk to commercial um, professional crops applicators a number of years ago. If you have two groups of applicators, one group using a product with the danger signal word, which means more acutely toxic, and everything being the same, you have another group of applicators using a product with signal word, which means less acutely toxic to almost non-toxic, which product do you think poses the greatest risk for something bad happening? How many say the product that's more acutely toxic? How many say the less acutely toxic product? Michelle's seen this before. So she, um, the answer is this. And I've given this to 11,000 professional applicators in the state of Minnesota. I've presented this over the years, too. Every single one, and we have about 17, 18,000 private applicators in our program, in addition to the professionals. I work on the professional side, Tana Hagen Brown does the farmers. The older the person in the audience, the more likely that person would answer that the safer product was more dangerous. Is that a clue why? Why? Why would more experienced applicators have more concern about a caution signal or less toxic pesticide? Because of what? Yes, we get complacent. It's safe. I don't have to follow the safety practices. We see this all the time. This is highly researched in occupational health and safety. Um, we we're careless with these things because we don't respect them. Something that's danger, poison, skull, and crossbone, the most acutely toxic pesticides, man, we almost never have an exposure in a poisoning because everybody's scared to death and will do a, absolutely the right thing. The label, Pesticide pesticide label tells you to do stuff for this product and people blow it off. What happens when you blow that off? Your exposure goes up. 
what happens to your probability of a long-term health effect occurring from the chronic exposure because you consistently blow off this, it goes up. That's why in an occupational health point of view, a safety point of view, this can be more hazardous. Um, the dose rules, the basis of toxicology, Paracelsus in the early 1500s founded the science of toxicology, and this is a direct quote from him, not in modern American English, obviously. He was in Europe. Uh, all substances are poisonous. Let that single statement sink in. This is true today as it was more than 500 years ago. All substances are poisonous. There is none which is not a poison. The right dose differentiates a poison from a remedy. It's the dose that makes the poison, not the toxicity makes the poison. And it really should be called exposure ecology and not toxicology because this is the science. Toxicology, to toxicity is set when you select the pesticide. That's its potential hazard inherent to the chemical. Exposure is how much reaches the body. And we look at probability of risk at that point, and we reduce exposure where applicators have a lot of control over reducing exposure to chemicals uh, by following the safety practices, wearing the personal protective equipment, and so on. Uh, once it enters the body, which is the dose, remember Roundup almost can't get through the skin on its own. Pesticides vary widely on whether they're absorbed through the skin, absorbed through the eyes, inhalation, or swallowing. So um, I'm not going to go into all of that right now, but dose is too late. We address first aid decontamination of medical treatment. That's the harm. How likely is that harm going to happen is a direct function of exposure much more than it is toxic the inherent toxicity of the product. So um, this is Occupational Safety 101. Your probability of a health risk is a combination of both toxicity and exposure. And in fact, exposure standards, safety standards are set looking at both the toxicity and exposure levels of a chemical under real life, situ under real life, which means the least toxic pesticide may not be the safest if you don't take into consideration exposure. So you see these policies put into face of saying, use the least toxic pesticide drives me insane. Use the least toxic pesticide. Well, that's a good thing, yes. I don't deny that. But if you're not taking into consideration exposure, your goal is not safety. Your goal is something else, if that's your primary focus. Uh, again, basic occupational safety. Um, Agricultural health studies, the gold standard, this started in 1993 in Iowa, North Carolina with 89,000 farmers. No epidemiological study looking at any pesticide coming even close to that. Uh, and it's funded by you, you and me, the American citizen taxpayers through EPA and Centers for Disease Control. Um, they, it's hundreds and hundreds of study to determine long-term health effects of pesticides on applicators. Farmers are an ideal group because they stay in the same place and do the same thing for many years. They don't move around. And so they become a really ideal group um, uh, for this. They looked at amount of exposure, not just whether they were exposed or not exposed for the uh, non-Hudson lymphoma and glyphosate study. The results were, were uh, uh, published in a peer review uh, journal in 2018, uh, and it really is globally seen uh, just head and shoulders above, in terms of strength, above anything else that, that's out there. Um, I like to ask this question, too, as a question of a side. Do farmers have higher rates of cancer than the general public, or do they have lower rates of overall cancer than the general public? How many say higher rates? I'm, a, I'm asking you to do an epidemiological expert opinion, and we're all trained in epidemiology, right? How many say lower? They actually have about only 75% the cancer rate of the general public. Skin cancer is a lot higher in farmers. Uh, there's some other cancers that are higher in farmers and their families. Brain cancer is one that we don't know the answer to. Overall, they eat better, they exercise better, they don't smoke as much, they do all the health lifestyle stuff that reduces your cancer rate, um, uh, just lifestyle-wise, compared to the general public. This is the same graph with one 95% confidence intervals, one being no effect, 
uh, we see absolutely no difference between the least exposed farmers and the most exposed farmers. The, why this is so important is this is a prospective study following actual farmers in real time, measuring actual exposure, and then watching what diseases they develop over the years. So much more powerful than a retrospective study, which everything else is on. So this is actual, real world stuff. And we see no association between glyphosate and cancer. The World Health Organization had that data, but it wasn't published in 2015 and didn't use it. They looked at five studies out of the more than 800 studies to make their determination. Of course, they used a process to protect, to, to select the studies to give them the best, you know, what uh, best balance. Um, so they came under some some uh, criticism for this. Uh, but, in fact, given what they had, uh, they probably made the right decision, looking at what they had because of the increase we saw with the non-Hudson lymphoma studies above 1.0 in general. Uh, this is how the WHO IRAC works. Um, bottom is uh, uh, probably not carcinogenic. We don't know because we don't have any research. Uh, 2B is possible carcinogenic, 2A is probable to humans, 1 is proven human carcinogen group. So they moved glyphosate from 2B possible to 2A probable, along with being a hairdresser, eating red meat, and some other chemicals, as a probable human carcinogen, uh, relative standard here. Interestingly enough, a year after, in 2016, they moved bacon and cured meats from probable human carcinogen to known human carcinogen. And they have, there's a substantial amount of research data ju uh, justifying this, uh, linking cured meats, including bacon, to colon cancer. Uh, and they felt that it was finally strong enough that it could be a known human carcinogen. Me, I'm a baby boomer. I watch broadcast news in the morning with my coffee. I waited for the public health expert in 2016 to come on my, the, the channel, the national uh, broadcast that I watch. Sure enough, they bring a public health expert on to talk about bacon and cancer. And what did that guy say? Not, you should all be afraid because there's residues in Cheerios. Uh, don't be afraid. Reduce your bacon consumption to two servings a week, and your exposure rate will be so low that you won't see any substantial increase in cancer. So, you know, in public health world, that makes our head explode, <laughs> you know, when we're, we're going crazy over this. But we have a far different view, far different relationship with, and a far different regulatory response to bacon than we do glyphosate, even though the research clearly shows that bacon is far more likely to be carcinogenic. And it has to do with things that science can't answer. It has to do with values that people have, their cultural traditions, and all kinds of other things that bacon is, I mean, we're not scared of bacon, <laughs> uh, as we are with this strange chemical that we can't even see in the Cheerios that we're giving our children. You start thinking about how we react to that. There's a whole literature on perception of risk by the public that has nothing to do with the science of how likely that risk is gonna happen has everything to do, we don't get upset, too upset when somebody dies trying to climb Mount Everest, which has a very high death rate because they voluntarily chose to do it. You did not voluntarily choose to have glyphosate residues in your food. And there's a whole series of those that why we treat bacon differently than we do herbicides that are very legitimate it's not illegitimate, it's very legitimate. Um, so you, uh, EPA reviewed the 800-some studies. This is a regulatory agency to regulate pesticides as carcinogens or not. And if they regulate it as a carcinogen, they probably would end up restricting or banning its use. Uh, they concluded not likely to be carcinogenic to humans at doses relevant to human risk uh, relevant to the human risk assessment, which means in real world situations. The European Union actually did the strongest review of this, a multi-year deep dive um, through the European Food Safety Authority, which hired the German Environmental Health uh, Agency, and they looked at all of the 800 plus studies that were out, not just the five that the World Health Organization looked at, uh, in depth, 300, almost 300 of them they went into real depth, and they concluded unlikely to cause cancer in humans, 
when used in real world situations. Uh, just in the last couple months, Canada and Brazil both reached the same conclusion in uh, regulating glyphosate after reviewing the literature, unlike not to regulate it as a carcinogen. In fact, every nation in the world that has gone through such a regulatory review of the literature has decided not to regulate glyphosate as a carcinogen. That's kind of stunning. Should we, as faculty of CFANS or Extension, advocate to ban the use of Roundup herbicide? It gets more complicated. I got a step or two more to go uh, on this story. Back to the chronic confusion. World Health Organization justifiably moves it into a probable human carcinogen. All of the regulatory agencies of all the nations in the world that have looked at this have, chose, have decided the evidence isn't strong enough that the likelihood of cancer given world, world, real world exposure isn't, isn't high enough to justify to write, uh, uh, regulate it as a carcinogen. In fact, both of these are true. That's why it's complicated. How do you explain this in a soundbite on Twitter with an advocacy group, and then you've got uh, multi, uh, how do I say this properly? You have multinational corporations <laughs> who have a financial interest and their own communications people using different sound bites. There, did I navigate that well? Um, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a veteran of those wars. Um, both of these are true because who is doing, is there potential for this to cause cancer under any circumstances? And the answer is probably. And that's justified by the, what we know. Will it cause, is it likely to cause cancer under normal world world exposures as used by farmers? Probably not. That's the difference. Um, so they're both true. One's regulatory, real-world risk assessment of probability it'll happen. The other one says, can it happen under any possible situation? Just like a kitchen knife. That's why I like the kitchen knife better than me prying a paint can open as the other example, which I used to use. So in public health world, they've developed standards using bioethical literature uh, determine when research literature justifies going in and mucking up people's lives and overriding their individual autonomy, uh, whether it's an educational intervention, which we do in extension, whether it's an engineering intervention, which CFANS is heavily involved in, whether it's genetic, mechanical, uh, ecosystem engineering, um, or do we go coercive to a regulatory intervention and force people uh, uh, to do this to minimize public harm? Again, we're looking at population level. Um, so they have a really well-developed system to look at every time they issue a vaccine. They know that there are a very small number of people who will be harmed when they put out a vaccine, but they don't know who those are. But the overwhelmingly good that vaccines can do overwhelms that, and they go through a real a, a actual ethical analysis to see if that's really justified in that each situation. The, the prevention paradox kind of gets at this. We often may be, what often may be best for the common good of the overall population in terms of public health may require individuals to accept changes or costs that may have a low probability of benefiting them personally. So you can see the tensions that can be generated when we look at moving into advocacy and we look at doing public interventions uh, when we force people or manipulate people to do what we think they should do. In education terms, we look at what's our goals, what are, what are our outcomes that we're trying to achieve. How you frame that has a lot to do with what values uh, and theory you're using. Target of change. Is this a failure of the regulatory system in glyphosate case, or is it a failure of educating applicators, or is it a fit corporate failure? Or is it a corruption failure? <coughs> Your target of change in solving this dramatically shifts where this all goes and what methods you use. And boy, if you can determine what success means, you can always be successful. I love that. I can determine, OK, we're going to be successful in this educational program if we do this. Man, if you can determine what the bar is for success, you'll always be successful. That's how manipulative this can be when you design a public intervention, unless you're really careful. 
and go through a public ethical analysis to make sure that you're not just sort of uh, 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 setting things up. Again, we're back to knowledge and understanding are not separated from political moral actions. Theory can't be select separate from uh, rational practice. And this is really the most important slide of the presentation. Uh, and is a fundamental piece of uh, public health interventions. And I'm going to try to walk you through this because there's a bunch of things going on. Uh, I came out from Warwick and Kelman in 1976. And public health looks at grouping public interventions to protect public health in three ways. There are their educational interventions, where it's kind of messy because you're educating people, uh, ignorance, develop their skills, or creating their capacity to decide for themselves engineering interventions, whether it's mechanical. Why have uh, deaths from vehicle accidents on the road dropped so dramatically in the last 30 years? What was the type of intervention? Has driving school gotten so much better? No. <laughs> Has our laws changed? Our speed limits actually have gone up. No. It's because you cannot get in a new car today without driving safer because the machine itself forces you through engineering to use that vehicle safer. That's why. It's an engineering. Um, marketing and advertising is manipulating people, is in an engineering, social engineering. Billions and billions of dollars are spent on marketing. Social marketing that sometimes gets promoted for education is actually manipulating people emotionally uh, to do what we want them to do. Uh, and that's really where advocacy falls, because we're, we're promoting, as paternalistic experts that we know better than the public of what their behavior should be. And we can have enough rash justice justification to do that based on the, on the common good of the public. When you get to enforcement, uh, it has the highest standard. The lowest standard is education. How many times I've heard, if we could just educate people to think like we do, or if we just educated people, they do what we want. Um, in my book, that's not education. That's up here manipulating people. But education sounds easier, safer, somehow voluntary. Uh, but it's really easy to slip into this paternalistic uh, mode that we know best if we just educate people and manipulate what they know to get them to do what we want. Um, that's not education. That is uh, overriding individual auto autonomy, which is a highly, highly held value in our culture. Um, incentives are flip coin of coercion from an ethical point of view because you're really changing the landscape of consequences for somebody making a choice. And I'm not going to go there. People feel it's voluntary. It's, it's, a, it's a different discussion. So we like to go to education first, but it's the messiest and least likely to get us to compliance. Engineering doesn't have the uh, standing of being coercive, so that makes it more attractive than enforcement. But it's more likely to get what we want to have happen. But you need a higher rationale, a higher standard to justify doing that to overcome and uh, overwhelm a uh, person's individual autonomy. Um, there's a lot of ethical questions out there. To save time, the big one here is, how should we decide how safe is safe enough when we regulate glyphosate? And public health has that system that they've developed. It's not perfect. It's not set in stone. There's lots and lots of the literature and arguments on at what point does the literature trigger justification in the United States given our, our form of government and our constitution and our laws and regulations to justify being coercive um, uh, to protect the public's health. This is not an, a question that science can answer. Science cannot answer this question. It's, it's a values question. Um, so how do we in, in land-grant mission justify to stakeholders whether we choose to go to advocacy or we should stay at education or why we didn't go to advocacy? In my job with pesticide safety education, we, we are held accountable to change people's behaviors through education. So we're really close to that engineering level because uh, I'll go through why in a second. Uh, why we are justified in doing that. But large parts of extension uh, doesn't have that justification in our education. So education is respecting individual autonomy, providing individuals, families, and communities research-based education, research education to enhance their knowledge, skills, and opportunity to decide for themselves what's best to do using their values, not ours. 
they get to decide, not us. We're not the paternalistic experts uh, deciding for them. And because we're a public institution, we have to respect all people, no matter who they are, uh, what their values are, uh, beliefs in those decisions, and respect those decisions. This is education. This is not um, social marketing uh, or social engineering. Can't be illegal. I can't tell you how often this comes up with pesticides. Talking to master gardeners over the Michelle shaking her head yes. But it works on bot. And I go, no, it's illegal. It's not on the label. You can't do it. But, but, but. And they want to do it. And they want to tell people. I go, no, you can't. It's illegal. We cannot recommend an illegal activity. And when I say it like that, they go, oh. You know, but they want to do it. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, is it a research-based recommended practice? We develop a wide range of technical solutions to choose from to control a pest. Which one or which combination, IPM, is the best one is, is a different question. Um, and then uh, is it a practice that respects the values and needs and autonomy of those involved? This is education. Now, when we go to advocacy, where we're saying we know better, and we want people to do what we want them to do, what do we have to look at? What's the criteria to move into advocacy with our land-grant mission? Over, overriding individual autonomy. Um, we have to have a strong support from the research base. In, in my opinion, and I'm kind of jumping the gun here, the research base, and I'm no epidemiologist, I rely on the people on the other campus for this, isn't quite there yet. It, uh, for a regulatory response, which is why we've seen that throughout the world. Um, accepted public policy and accepted public outcome goods. Uh, if we go against our stakeholders, we better have a really, really airtight rationale uh, if we cross purposes with our stakeholders and funders and so on, uh, if we go into advocacy. Uh, and if you're a college dean or you're dean, dean and director of extension, you're very conscientious of this every time you walk into the state capitol um, uh, in, in those modes. Um, and do we have authority to advocate in this matter? I can't tell you how many times master gardeners with their master gardener hat on wanted to go and stage a protest at one of the big boxes on neonicotinoid insecticides that affect pollinators. And we go, but you know, you're not seen as people who understand that. Well, with glyphosate, we should be uh, out there telling everybody not to use glyphosate because it causes cancer. And I go, but you're not recognized as a toxicologist with your master gardener hat on. You're not recognized as an epidemiologist. We don't train you in toxicology and epidemiology in your master gardener core course. That's not your area of authority. And um, I've actually seen this happen, so I'm not going to go there. But it would be as if an epidemiologist from the School of Public Health in the Division of Environmental Health went out on the road and talked to farmers about the best, best way to control Palmer amaranth. What would be the weed scientist's reaction to that? So why do we feel authorized to go out and promote expertise we don't have when we have people here in this university who have that expertise? And then you go to advocacy groups, whether it's industry or not, or environmental, and you look at how they interpret these studies uh, compared to what the, the field of epidemiology does. And you really get major discrepancies from what's, what's going on in the public and what the science actually says that influences public policy. Uh, we have to be really conscientious of what our authority is and how we're seen uh, as having that authority. I'm a safety guy. I can talk about safety and be respected for safety all day long. I cannot talk about health because I have no credentials nor do I have expertise in medical type things. But I can, I can say I'm a safety expert in the work that I do. So now, how should we, should we advocate right now the banning of glyphosate as a extension service? Uh, go to that advocacy road based on what we know. Where are we at now? Is this an appropriate thing for those of us in extension or in CFANS to do? I think you know what my feeling is at the moment. We can educate, which we do, and Michelle and other people in extension have been worked with us on educating people who use glyphosate on this material. 
But we do say both of those things are true. It's a probable human carcinogen, but the likelihood of getting cancer using it in a real world situation is very, very low. And we can say that with some confidence at the moment. But that's very different than advocating officially with my University of Minnesota hat on uh, that it should be banned. So in my program, and I'm wrapping up now, is uh, uh, we're held accountable for behavioral changes. So we actually are held accountable to get into advocacy on wearing the personal protective equipment, following the label directions, uh, practices to protect water, because we do have that research base, which is pretty extensive in pesticides, on those topics. We do have the public authority through federal and state laws and regulations that relate to certification of pesticide applicators and the education that's part of that effort uh, to do that. And we are seen as the authorities in that area of environmental protection and applicator safety, given who we are and the work we do. So a lot of my job really, I'm obligated to move more in that advocacy mode to change behavior, and I can justify it. But um, I think I'm in a sort of a unique place uh, within extension because we have all those pieces uh, there. So if I don't change behaviors, uh, I'm held accountable <laughs> yeah, negatively. Um, I think with that, I better stop. Um, that was a fast ride through a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, but I, I take any questions or comments. Uh, I do use this. This actually is very practical. I use this in a logic model that then I build a business plan uh, to put our program development process together. And so I have the inherent rationale to stakeholders of why we choose the outcomes we want to see, why we choose the target of change. We want to change education and learning uh, and knowledge and skills in applicators why we choose the educational methods we do, and what the measures of success are. And it's built right in by taking this rationale, putting it into a logic model, which was developed by University of Wisconsin Extension in the 1980s and is widely used for program planning purposes, and then translating that and putting that into a larger program management or business plan. Uh, so it becomes inherent in actually uh, explaining what we do instead of trying to provide accountability separate. Um, that's the advantage of that. But that's another whole seminar. So I'll stop talking. So thank well, you. Let's take well, we've got time for a couple of questions. You, I don't care. Go ahead. I'm just curious, the study you were talking about that provided the, the most support with the 89,000 mm -hmm. are they planning to continue following the So. The agricultural health study is ongoing, and they're looking at a lot of pesticides and a lot of long-term health problems, not just this one. So there's ongoing research. Uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing with glyphosate and non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, uh, coming up, but uh, that, that particular study, uh, so you don't cherry-pick studies, but that particular study really did change the landscape because of the nature of what it was. Um, Yes. My, my question relates to that. Like that study was so comprehensive, looking at the various uh, rates of exposure for such a large demographic. It was the rate of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in that study was within within the. the uh, I, I don't know if the farmers in the study what their rate of non-Hodgkin lymphoma was compared to the general public. <laughs> That would be, that's a different question, and I don't know what that is. But um, they were looking at level of exposure, which is more than just were you exposed or not exposed, which gives us more information. It makes it stronger. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how many times have you given this presentation to the general public, and what was their response? Uh, I've given a very different version in a very different way uh, uh, in the Master Gardener core course for about 10 years. Uh, not the glyphosate talk and not the public ethics talk, but the values piece of how values, one of the things I did, that's why I had IPM in there and I never talked about IPM because uh, I'm an IPM guy, was uh, I brought values into IPM and if master gardeners working with different people, it's not the master gardener's personal opinion whether they're an organic, because they get, I just want to nuke it. Tell me what I can nuke it with or I'll never touch a chemical. Please don't have me. That's what master gardeners get. 
And we have to respect the values of, of the, the, the people they work with. And so I have this whole series, and Michelle's seen this too because she worked with me on it and helped me uh, develop the IPM uh, structure that we use in extension. Um, so I show them a picture of a topiary landscape, just perfectly trimmed. And I say, you know, I ask, is this your yard? Is this a yard perfection? Or is this a perfectionist? Or is this a guy who doesn't know how to fish? You know, some humor. And I use the clickers so that nobody has to raise their hand because we're Minnesotans. And they all are surprised that people answer all different ways. That people sitting right next to them see this as the, perf the, the pinnacle of what they do for gardening. And other people are horrified that it's even considered gardening. And then I show them a picture of a junk car in an overgrown lot. And I ask similar questions. Is it performance art and so on? And uh, nice land, wild, wild, uh, wild landscape. And that same thing happens. And then I give the killer one. I show a picture of a turf with dandelions. And the question is, too many dandelions? Should you treat? Nice wildflowers. There's a couple more choices. And the fights break out when they show the results up on the screen because there's people who, oh, you got to get rid of her. And other people are like, no, they're really nice wildflowers. What do you mean you're? And these are master gardeners. And they, they realize that the educational moment is they realize that everybody has different values. There's no right or wrong in that. And trying to get into this ethics piece of what they're doing and that their personal feelings, when they're master gardeners, they're under the land-grant mission of the University of Minnesota. They have to uh, guard against that. So I use it in that way, but that's very different than what I presented here. I guess my question is a little more general. Okay. The focus on glyphosate has been a single herbicide. Okay. And when glyphosate was introduced, right away we went away from about seven different herbicide applications. When we had GMO crops. Yes. That was the other the piece. Point. So we eliminated Treflin, Ampa, but a lot of these were really nasty herbicides. So That's right. Did they look at the balance between potential so, hazards of glyphosate and all the hazards that existed with these other herbicides? So, Jim, you've asked a really good question, I think, and, and I can partially answer that. The WHO in our IARC, they don't, they don't, they're not looking at that at all. They just want to know, under any possible circumstance, could glyphosate cause cancer? So the value of glyphosate is a non sequitur to them. They're not involved in regulatory or use or anything. That's why it's apples to oranges and both are true. The EPA, actually, under FIFRA, um, there is a benefit a, a, a risk-benefit piece in there that is not common in other of our environmental laws in the United States. So there is a consideration. Their EPA under FIFRA actually has to consider that kind of benefits. But in other parts of environmental and health in the United States, there is much less emphasis on the benefits part. Um, that's that's uh, somewhat unique in how that plays out with pesticide regulation because it's true. That's why I put that slide up there about the uh, uh, how low acute toxicity and low absorption and low chance of this of ground up getting into water. I mean, you, I mean, it's just like you don't find chemical herbicides like this every day that have those characteristics and they replaced um, uh, some pretty nasty things. Uh, neonicotinoids are the same thing. They were fast-tracked by EPA to replace highly toxic pesticides. And they got caught because of the pollinator piece. They were literally fast-tracked to registration. Oh, jumped way ahead in the game because they were seen as so much safer than the insecticides they were replacing that the pollinator effects got lost in that whole discussion because they were more focused on the benefit side of fast-tracking the neonicotinoid insecticides. So there's an example where it went the other way. Um, but yeah, in pesticides, they actually do antimicrobials. One-third of all pesticides are antimicrobials, the largest group of pesticides. Germanicides, you know, you can buy them in hard. Bleach, this is another thing I do with master gardeners. You can go to a hardware store, buy bleach, same stuff in both containers. One's a pesticide, one's not. But the substance in the container is exactly the same. 
and one's a pesticide, one's not. One's a really good sanitizing cleaning product, the other one kills germs. It's a marketing thing that determines whether we regulate something as a pesticide. And um, uh, in antimicrobials, the benefits piece is really strong because you have this massive public health aspect of these antimicrobials used in healthcare facilities. And uh, if you put an antimicrobial pesticide on the market, you have to show that it's effective. For most all other pesticides, you don't really have to show it's effective at all to get it through EPA. But the antimicrobials, you actually have to have research data to show it's effective because there's such an enormous public health consequence um, uh, on that side of the benefit package. And one third of all pesticides are germanicides. Lysol is a pesticide. <laughs> Some, it's really fascinating the marketing terms that EPA says makes it a pesticide, claims it kills germs, and which ones just clean really well. Uh, same substance can be in both containers. One, one's like you know, $100 million cheaper to bring to market than the other one. And they think they can make it up in sales by claiming it kills germs. I mean, it's literally the marketing psychology that goes on. That's another whole lecture, and I do that with master gardeners, too. <laughs>